continue just to stay in the presence and share the story with you. And if you want to you want to just take a break, you can. You and then we're going to worship. It's about worship this story. So, we're just doing it in a different order. <laughs> Cuz we are in church or conferences or Bush Bush Church every single day and we you can see Papa Roland and I, we like to do it, mix it up, don't you think? So we're going to do all the worship until they have to lock the doors because the alarm goes on. That's what we're doing. We tend to do that in most spots. <laughs> and I like it when they have to carry people out to their cars. That's a very, very nice thing. That would be good for that to happen tonight. Whoa. You just keep going. The only thing I'm going to ask is if you would please sit and pray. If you would sit on the floor and pray on the floor. Or sit on a chair and pray on the chair. That would be great. Shaka Rabba Santo Riandai. Now, I'm going to ask you to participate again. And you're going to pray right now for the presence of God to crash in through this word. So I'm going to ask you to pray right now for the presence of God to crash in through this word as he crashes in and heals these people. Come on. Jesus. 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 Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, this is your house, this is your people, this is your place, God. We say, we love you, Lord, we stop for you, Lord, we wait for you, Lord, we worship you, Lord Jesus. We don't want to do anything that you're not doing. Daddy God, we want to hear you. Thank you, 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 God. So take all these people. As you're healing them, Lord, heal their hearts. I feel like God's opening spiritual eyes. Yeah, I feel like God's saying where there were polluted pools, there are clear streams coming, clear streams, clear streams, clear streams. Oh, um, I, I heard the Lord say he was healing someone of chain smoking. You're a smoker, you've battled for years you love Jesus but you just haven't been able to quit smoking and Jesus is setting you free tonight thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus wow okay I told Jason to get a break right now and just get to listen. Shaka Baba. And then we're going to worship, okay? And another thing, you can leave whenever you like, okay? Just do it kind of gently so it doesn't look too scary to me. Awesome. I want to share a message from the book of John. Do you know that book? I love the book of John. This is John 4. And it's a great story about Jesus getting tired. I love that Jesus gets tired. Wait. Wait. Yeah, I'm going to wait till you guys kind of sit somewhere. Just because I know Roland can uh, do it, but it's a little harder for me. So find a spot somewhere on the floor. I told you I was on my head in church, so. <laughs> okay, so Jesus was um, going from town to town, baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not John, it was not 
Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea, went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go to Samaria. And so he came to a town in Samaria called Sinkar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour of the day. Is this not encouraging? Don't you think that's really wonderful news? We, do you know, okay, you're going to track with me in a minute. Shakaraba. You're going to get, you're going to track, you're going to get it. You're going to get this. Oh. See what happened. Oh, I'm excited. They're praying over there. See, I like it. A lot of people, did you know God's a multitasker? God's a multitasker. Seriously. Some people are getting healed. Other people are getting whacked by God. Some are getting set free. Sometimes it's scary to people like meetings that we have are scary because it's like, why are they laughing? Why are they crying? Why are they shaking? Why are they falling? Well, God showed up. And so darkness is leaving and light of Jesus is coming. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. So just be thankful. You know, see, it's just, it's the way it is. Church used to be so quiet. Shaka Baba. It's not anymore. Here we are. Listen to this. Philippians 2.1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, Shandaraba. What is the attitude of Christ Jesus? What is Jesus' attitude? Your attitude should be that, the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. What did Jesus do? Holy. He made himself nothing. That scripture may help you to understand John 4. Jesus literally emptied himself out so fully kenosis he so fully gave himself away he so poured himself out he so became totally abandoned that he needed holy spirit every moment of every day he needed holy spirit jesus chose for the sake of love to be needy Jesus chose for the sake of love to be needy. Jesus chose for the sake of love to be needy. He needed to be nursed at his mother's breast. He emptied himself out so fully that he literally went into the womb of a woman and was born as a baby in the dirt. He needed to learn the language of the people he was surrounded by. He needed to be fed. He needed water. He needed 
Why did he do that? What kind of love would cause our gods to so totally, totally humble himself and become a man, to become a, not even born a man, born a baby? What kind of love is that? Holy, what is he asking us to come and do? How is he showing us what love looks like? How does he call us to live and walk in this world that we live in? What does it look like to love like Jesus? What does it look like to smell like Jesus? What does it look like to be the hands of Jesus extended on this earth? Did he come as a ruler and a king? It's a question. Did he come as a mighty ruler and king? How did he come? He came and he served. He came and he got super low and he, he got super slow and he served. He just... He just came and gave up everything. And he, he wasn't schizophrenic. Jesus wasn't schizophrenic. He actually knew who he was, and he still gave himself away. He had the right to everything. He had the right to everything. He could have demanded and commanded anything, absolutely anything, and yet, for the sake of love, he made himself nothing. He made himself so nothing that he literally needed water from a woman of Samaria who was unclean. What, what was he thinking? Imagine what he was thinking when he made himself so vulnerable that he actually got tired. This blesses me as a minister, you know. It blesses me to know Jesus got tired and he knew exactly what to do. When he got tired, he sat down. May I please have some of that water? Thank you so much. I'm thirsty. <laughs> it says Jesus, being the very in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, and he took on the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient to death, even the death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And right after teaching this, this servant, this servant love, this power, that came as he humbled himself and became nothing, just as he teaches us this, just as he explains this in the word through Paul, it says in verse 12 of Philippians 2, Therefore, dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God 
who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Right after explaining what he did for us, he said, Now, beloved, now you who say you love me, you who say you want to follow me, you who say that I am your all and all, you who worship me in wholehearted abandon, now do everything without complaining or arguing. And pure children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Now, which is it? What? Which one is it? Are we going to be servants or stars? Are we supposed to be servants? Are we supposed to be stars? I don't understand. And yet he says again, therefore, dear friends, Paul speaking here, who have obeyed, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. That's what Roland was speaking about today. It's union and unity. Union and unity, God works in you. And then do everything, everything, I mean everything. How could I do everything without complaining? That's ridiculous. What's he thinking about anyway? Do everything without complaining? I mean, what if they're, what if I don't like what they're doing? What if I don't like something? What if I don't feel something special going on in my presence, in their presence, in my presence? Do everything without complaining, arguing, as pure children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation? It means we're not living in La La Land. We're not living in la-la land, not inside the church, not outside the church. There's always stuff going on. There's always some kind of thing we can be complaining about and arguing about and upset about and grumbling about and grouchy about because there's always something we can find fault with somehow. But he says, no, no. Walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, minister like Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for that precious woman getting set free. I thank you, Jesus, that your power is so powerful and glorious. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit told me to tell you a story. I have two scriptures um, books that I'm going to look at tonight, Philippians and John 4. But my story is this. I was, I was in a village um, with, with uh, a lot of my kids and some teams, and we were honoring the chiefs. And we were sitting with the chiefs on our grass mat, and, and suddenly uh, I heard a whole lot of screaming, just a huge commotion. And I... I was sitting there and, and I was speaking to these chiefs and I was listening to their story and just making friends. And suddenly I noticed a whole group of children running and this screaming, a terrible screaming going on, a little bit like what you heard over there. Only it was very loud and very intense. And I, I asked Jesus, now what should I do here? Because I'm honoring these men, and yet somebody's obviously in distress. So that time the Lord said, I want you to go and go to where the screaming is. So I said to the chiefs, excuse me, 
um, I'll be right back. I just need to attend to somebody who's hurting. And so I found myself walking over to where some foreigners had left their garbage. The foreigners had left some plastic bottles and delightful things that villagers really wanted. And so a little boy had jumped into the middle of the pile of garbage that the foreigners had left. And he was started to have a huge epileptic fit. He was possessed by the forces of darkness. He was in shredded rags. He was epileptic. His eyes rolled back of his head. His tongue rolled back. And um, all I did, I didn't yell at him. He was hurting. I didn't think he would like to be yelled at, you see. If you're hurting and you're in pain, you don't want to be yelled at. You would like to be loved. So I took the little precious boy and I held him in my arms. And um, the first thing that happened was he weed all over my kapalana. He, he had lost control of his bodily functions, you see. So my kapalot is often wet, so I didn't mind. I just held him and I, I rocked him in my arms and he was completely, utterly set free just in a moment. It wasn't a screaming match. It wasn't some contest. And I, I just carried him back to the grass mat where I was speaking to the chief. And I carried him back and I continued my conversation. And I was sitting there with them, sitting, talking, listening, watching. And I said to them, I'm just holding this little guy. He's totally, he just falls asleep in my arms. It was so beautiful, completely set free, just completely at peace, fell in love with Jesus just, just in an instant. And I said to the chiefs in the, after a while, they were looking at me, kind of trying to understand what was going on. And I said, um, you know, we would love to have a, a church here. It was 100%, that village had been 100% people of another faith. 100% people of another faith. And without understanding how those chiefs felt, we would continue just, we would be stoned in the village. But because Jesus allowed them to see his love and power as this little guy was set free, they were very attentive. And we were looking at one another and just having a really beautiful time. And I said, I would love to, to see a, a, some kind of place here where people could worship Jesus, where they could worship the Father, where they could be blessed. Is there any way, perhaps, that we could purchase some land? And the men, they were all chiefs and elders, they said, come with me. So I followed them, and we walked, and we walked, and we walked, and it's hot, and we're walking, and I don't know where we're going. And uh, something good's happening. And we walked and walked and walked. Thank you for whatever wonderful things happening there. And do you know what they said? They pointed to this beautiful piece of property where they were going to put a well. They said, would this property be good? I said, this property would be excellent. They said, um, we could never imagine selling you property. This is yours. Take it. Just take it. That happens all the time. It's just walking and talking like Jesus and all of us just doing. You see, 
multitasking God. He's doing all kinds of things. He's touching people in all kinds of ways. That is a beautiful thing. As we're going to worship God, there are going to be so many things going on. There's one little, just a little thing I'm asking that you could write down what God's doing. And that you could just somehow, I don't even know, let somebody know. Let Give it to somebody in charge. That's definitely not me. But give it to somebody just to say what God's doing, you know. It's beautiful. So back to John 4. Jesus was sitting down. And he was talking to a lady. He was just talking to this lady. And, and they were making friends. I don't think it was an evangelistic crusade. I really don't think they had any posters. I don't think they had any book tables. But what they had was a very sad woman who nobody else wanted to talk to and Jesus. His disciples had already gone off. His disciples wanted to buy food. And so here was Jesus just sitting there talking to one woman. It wasn't like a crowd of people were around. And why did Jesus stop and sit with that woman? Yes. He was, he was tired and thirsty. Did I just read Philippians? So you understand I'm not being strange here? Jesus emptied himself out to the extent that he got tired and thirsty. That he knew what to do and he knew where to go. He knew what to do and he knew where to go. And this book here that we're talking about, this chapter, talks about worship. This is all about worship. This is a book about worship. This is a book about worship. But first he sat down and had a drink. I don't think they had Pepsi. But they had something that was nice and clear and cool. And Jesus wanted it. So what he did, water, correct. I mean, that's an excellent answer. What what happened was he asked that lady for a drink. And when he asked that lady for a drink, he had to look at her and ask. Now, nobody else ever looked at that lady. Nobody else ever saw her. Nobody else talked to her. Nobody else spent any kind of time with her. Why? She wasn't clean. She wasn't clean. She wasn't desirable. That woman did not have her life together she didn't have her act together she was a broken hurting woman in our country nobody is this true nobody but goes and gets water at noontime do they do they go for to get water at noontime in our country it's hot if you went to get water you would never get water in the middle of the day if you got water in the middle of the day you would be sick from fainting from the heat. Nobody does that. But for one reason or another, this woman had to get water in the middle of the day. She was unlovely. She was without friends. She was all alone. She was broken. And she was hurting. It wasn't a multitude. It wasn't a big crowd. It wasn't a huge lot of people with wonderful sound systems. It was just a little broken woman and a thirsty Jesus. And Jesus looked at her and he said, would you please give me a drink? Would you please give me a drink? Ah, oh, Jesus, you're so good. You teach us so well. The Samaritan woman came to draw water, and she was very confused by Jesus' question. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, 
You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Different tribes. What are you thinking? Do you think I'm going to get water from you? Do you think? What are you thinking? It's a trick. If I give you water, you're going to do something to this water. It's a trick. It's a bad. Something's wrong with this question. I am a Samaritan. You are a Jew. What do you think asking me for water? She started to have a theological argument with him. Oh, she did. She was offended even at the point of not wanting to respond to him. But because he was low and slow enough, and because he was in need, something happens when we're in need. I need water. I need water, Jesus said. And that woman who hadn't connected with anyone in many, many years hadn't connected on any pure level, on any powerful level, suddenly she's starting to connect with this man, Jesus, who is in need of water. He didn't even mind that she was having a theological discussion. Jesus is thinking, perhaps it's true I'm a Jew. And it's true, you're a Samaritan, but it's true that I need this water. So please, woman, could I have some water? Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you've nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and flocks and herds? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is calling you to be a spring. That Ezekiel 47, that Revelation 22 river, it's called to bubble, bubble, bubble up inside of you. You are called to give Jesus a drink to give Jesus a drink of worship, to give Jesus a drink of love, to give Jesus a drink of adoration. You are called to satisfy the thirst of a God who would give himself away so that you could worship in absolute holiness and abandonment. You are called to give Jesus a drink. You are called to give Jesus a drink. Another day I was walking in a village. I spent two days, Thursday and Friday in the village and Monday for about three, four hours. So I spend almost three days a week in the village, in the deep in the village. I love it. It's where I find my life. And I was um, just walking around the village and um, talking to some people. And I'm, again, I was talking to chiefs. And the chief said, come and visit my home. Come and visit my house. And so I went, and it was a long way. And I walked past a mosque. Now, as I walked past a mosque, I noticed that some of the um, young pastors, they were very uh, frightened by what I did next. They looked at, they were just fidgeting and worried about it. 
But what I did next was I went right up to the Shehas and I said, how are you doing today? Isn't this a beautiful Friday? Are you about to go and pray? My name's Mama Ida. It's so nice to meet you. What's your name? And the Shehas, one by one, started telling me their names. I said, it's great to meet you. I started hugging the Shehas. I said, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, do you ever get thirsty? They said, yes, we get thirsty. I said, how's your water situation in the village? How's it going for you? And they said, it's terrible. We have a well over there, but it's dry. I said, well, we've come because we would like to bring living water here. We would like to bring living water here, and we would like to bring... We would like to bring lots of living water and we would like to drill a well so you can drink from it. And suddenly one of the sheikh has said, well, guess what? I have an understanding of well drilling, he said. I know how to fix those pumps. I said, has anyone asked you to fix the pumps? He said, no, nobody's ever asked me anything of the sort. I said, well, could we work together? Could we work together? And he started saying, absolutely, we can work together. This is amazing. I said, well, I'm going to go visit the chief, but I'll come back. And we made great friends with the Shehas. And they, I told them that I was going to build a place to worship Jesus there. And I asked, would they like to come? And some of them said, yes, we would like to come. It was as simple as that. Well, what happened was I'm never in a hurry. This is a problema for some people. It's a big problema for some people, but I like relationship. And so I find myself being late all the time for something. Late, late. My kid, yes, Pasquale knows. Late, late, late. Mel knows. Late, late, late. I decided to sit with the chief's wife and peel some vegetables. This was a long process. It was a long process. I mean, I could have been reaching 10,000 people somewhere. And I'm sitting there peeling my little vegetables with this lady, making friends with her, praying for her, seeing her get healed, just like all these people over here. It was wonderful. And then these two German girls came over to me. And they said, there's a woman over there. And she's dying. I said, that's, that's, that's not good. They said, she's dying. You need to go right now. That woman's dying. And I looked at those German girls and I said, weren't you just there? Weren't you just there? They said, yes, we were just there. She's dying. We came to get you. She's blind and deaf. I said, weren't you just there? I said, I'm, I'm peeling vegetables right now with the chief's wife. But when I'm done, I'll go and I'll visit your new friend. Do you know her name? No, we don't know her name. She's dying and she's blind and deaf. I said, I bet she has a name. Well, when I was finished with the vegetables, I got up slowly and I went to where this woman was. I've never in 37 years, most of them working among the poor, I've never seen what I saw that day. She had been covered in a kapalana, covered all over her head. She was curled up in a bowl, and she hadn't been given any water. No water for a very long time. Her nails were so long that they curled over and almost touched into her fingers. Her toenails were so long, they curled over, and I was undone by the sight of this woman. Her skin, she was totally, completely dehydrated. Her eyes were actually rolled back in her head. 
Jesus was thirsty. You see, without water, without water we die. Without water we do not survive. Somehow her family had decided she was no longer useful. She was no longer valuable. She was too old and she was costly and so it was simply her time to die. I'd found a relative and I said, what's going on? They said, oh, she's just dying. So I found some water. And before I prayed the prayer of salvation, I simply gave that woman water. I didn't do anything complicated. I just held her. She hadn't been bathed in, could have been years. Shredded rags, just gave her water. And these German girls were watching. I'm thinking, you know, we're not doing anything strange here. They're watching, and then all the girls had been let out of the mosque, the, the girls' side of the mosque. They all came, and they were all around me watching, and I was just giving one lady water. Now there's 30, 40, 50 people just watching me, just doing a simple thing like giving a woman some water. Nothing complicated, nothing theologically complex, nothing difficult to understand. Just a little bit of water for a woman who hadn't had a drink. Just, put, just, just gently touched her eyes and she could see very, nothing scary. No lights and video cameras. Just eyes opened up. She looked at me, drank some more water, and I asked Jesus, what would love look like right now after the water? Cut her toenails. <laughs> cut her toenails. Well, I didn't have anything to cut her toenails, so I said, does anybody have anything to cut her toenails? And suddenly... The villagers that I'd just been working with and ministering to in some other spot, they said, yes, 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 we have something to cut our toenails. And they got very excited because some foreigner had a toenail clipper and it just broke instantly. It was useless. But a villager had something very useful. Uh, um, uh, I forgot the English. Uh, epa. Esqueci. A faca. É uma faca. Uh, like a fuck up, like, it was a fuck up. I don't know what else to, that's what it was. That doesn't sound good in your language. I, I just thought of that. But in our language, it's what you used to cut a toenail. I forgot the English. Anyway, it's like a razor knife. Razor knife. Sweet Jesus. Anyway, I was, I, I didn't, Lord have mercy, but we were cutting her toenails. And I didn't, I didn't have to do it because three, four of my village friends were doing it. The German girls now are falling in the dirt, sobbing. Sobbing, sobbing. I'm, I'm look. I, I didn't know. I mean, all we did was give some water to a dying woman and have some friends cut her toenails. There's now 50, 60 people around watching. I'm thinking, hmm. Well, what would love look like now for this woman? I thought, I think it would look like food. I think she's very, very hungry. And before I said anything, the chief came and he was just very close to this woman. He'd never seen her before. He didn't have eyes to see one dying woman. He had no eyes to see one dying woman. He was blind himself. She could actually see. It was him who was blind. 
as I watched her eyes open, I watched the German's eyes open, and I watched the chief's eyes open, and there he came, a huge plate of food. And I looked at him, I said, will you make sure this lady has food for the rest of her long life? He said, absolutely, I make a promise to you that she will have food for the rest of her long life. And there was a, her, we thought it was her sister, but it was her own daughter who had covered her up to let her die. She was there and she had rejected prayer from the two girls that she then said, you know, I think I need prayer. You better pray. You better all pray for me right now. And this little lady with joy in her eyes and a smile with most of her teeth gone, she's just She's looking at all these people now, attending to her. She feels like she's in some kind of spa in your world. She's been having her legs washed and a pedicure and a manicure with a, I won't say our word for it. She's completely full of joy and I find just a few more minutes, and I say, would you like to know Jesus? He's the one we love. He's the reason we stop, because Daddy God stopped for us, and Jesus came and lived for us and walked in your world and understands your pain. And she said, oh, yes, of course I would like to meet Jesus. It was just a delightful day. I'm sure I was late for something. Hey, well, back to our story. Jesus was having a discussion with this lady. And she's saying, well, you don't have anything to draw with. And this, this is very deep. And I don't understand. And he says, are you greater than a... That? No, she says, not he says. He says, she says. He says, she says. She says, he says. He says, she says. Let's get it right, for goodness sakes. Are you greater than the one our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? Whose turf are you on anyway? Hmm. Jesus answered, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. I will be in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We need the Ezekiel 47 river. We need the Revelation River, Revelation 22, from the throne and of the Lamb, from the throne and of the Lamb, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water is thirsty, but you will not have to be thirsty. The woman said, sir, give me the water so I don't have to get thirsty and keep coming here and be reminded that I'm unlovely and unclean. I don't want to be reminded of that. Please do something else. And Jesus said, go and call your husband and come back. And she said, no, no, I don't have a husband. I don't have a husband. And Jesus acknowledged and loved her at that moment. I want you to think about that moment. Can you think about it? What did Jesus do when she said she had no husband? What did he do? He's... He said, I know. He affirmed her. He said, well done, woman. You didn't lie to me. He didn't say, you filthy wretch. 
You've had all these husbands, and you expect me to drink with you here at this water? I won't touch your unclean cup. I won't touch you. I won't look with you. I will not see you. I will not sit with you because you are not a clean woman. He did not do that to her. He looked her in the eyes and he said, I know. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you for telling the truth. Thank you for being honest. Thank you now, dear woman. Now that dear woman starting to get her heart touched by the living Jesus. She's starting to fall in love with a man. Her heart is starting to beat. Her heart's starting to beat fast within her chest. She's finally connecting with the one who loves her purely. She's finally connecting with the one who loves her like nobody else has ever loved her. She's finally connecting with him. And she's starting to fall in love with Jesus. Oh, thank you for telling me the truth. You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five. You've had five. Five. Can you imagine five? That lady's had at least four. And the man you now have isn't even your husband. What you said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see it. I can see it. I can see it right now. You're a prophet. You're a prophet. Oh, wow, wow, wow. She had two things she could have done. She could have run from the prophet who knew everything about her, all the things she'd done wrong, all the things she'd messed up, all the things she'd completely screwed up in her life. He could have run from her. She could have run from him. Or she could have just waited like she did and listened and started to fall deeply, 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 deeply in love with this man who literally radiates love, carries love, walks in love. Everything Jesus did was full of love and compassion. Even when he rebuked people for their sin, it was powerful, full of love and compassion. Sir, I can see you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem Jesus declared believe me woman a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you Samaritans worship what you do not know but we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. We are going to worship God tonight with our entire beings. We're literally going to worship God with every breath, every action, every thought, every motive. We're going to completely abandon ourselves in worship. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to worship Father God. We're going to worship. We're going to worship Him with all that is within us. We are going to become the offering tonight. We are going to say to God, Lord, you are worthy. As an act of faith, as I finish these last few verses, I'm going to ask you to stand. An act of faith saying, I am going to step in to a new place of worship. 
I'm going to step into a new place of adoration. I'm going to step in and allow that living river water to overflow me. I'm going to allow myself to go so deep into the presence of God. If you could turn up my monitor, I'd be so grateful just because of my weak voice right now. I want you to close your eyes and listen to these words. I thank you very much. That's amazing. A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Holy Spirit, my friend, I'm asking you for sacrificial offerings tonight. Not of finance. That's so easy. But Lord, I'm asking of sacrificial offerings of lives. Oh, get yielded right now, get yielded right now, get yielded right now. Holy Spirit is healed. He's set free. He's delivered. He's healed marriages. He's set people free. He's here in the room. And God's looking for spiritual worshipers who will worship. Listen, 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 listen to what he's longing for. Oh, listen to what he's longing for. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. That means they don't just go through the motions and think about CNN and whether North Korea is going to be blowing up South Korea tonight whether a bomb's going to hit the nation, whether they're going to have chicken or beef, but their eyes and their hearts and their minds are set on worshiping the one who is the one, and he looks at them with full of love in his eyes and says, I love you. I love who you are. I know who you are. I know who you are. I know who you are. And I love you. I know you. I know you. I know you. And I love you. I know you. And I love you. The other day, I was walking down a hill in the middle of the day. It was around noontime. Stay in the present, stay in the present, stay in the present. And I was passing by a hut, and I was very, very, very late for a discipleship meeting. And some of the pastors in that meeting were in charge of over 2,500 churches. So it was a meeting that I do every week to disciple the ones that disciple the multitudes. But I figured if God had shown me a little woman, a little old woman sitting in the dirt with white eyes, that those that I discipled would know what to do. They would be okay with mama being late again because they would understand that God himself had opened my eyes and let me see. So there I was again, walking down a hill at noontime. And one little woman was sitting by the road. She was old. She was blind. She was blind and she was old. And I walked up to her and I said, what is your name? What is your name? And that little old lady couldn't look me back in the eyes because she had blind eyes and she couldn't look at me. 
And I looked at her and I said again, holding her hands. And she na na ti pani, and she na na ti pani. And she responded to me, I have no name. I have no name. And I thought, oh God, how is it possible that any human being has no name? I asked a woman a little ways away, what's her name, what's her name? Has she forgotten her name? And the woman said, she has no name. She's blind, she has no name. She's blind, she has no name. first thing I did was give her a name and the name I gave her in the Makua dialect is you exist you are you are you exist you are and I gave her a name I gave her a name believe tonight God himself wants to stop for you God himself wants to look into your eyes and open them up and let you see and he wants to speak your name over you and let you hear her eyes and she said yes to the Messiah that day oh, and when I got when I walked back to my meeting they were all happy happy worshiping God didn't even notice I was late Maybe I was on time. So the disciples returned and they were freaked out to find Jesus talking with the woman. But they looked really sweet. Oh, sweet, 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 sweet. They didn't ask, what are you doing? Why are you talking with her? That woman was so in love, she forgot about her water. She was so in love with Jesus, she forgot about her water. You are so nice. She forgot about her water, and she left her water pot right there. And she went back to the town, and she said to the people, Come and see a man. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. He knows about the five husbands. He knows that I'm in an affair. 
He knows everything I'm doing. He knows everything, 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 everything. Could this be the Christ? I felt my heart beat. I felt my heart warmed when I was with him. He was so pure and so kind. I gave him water, do you know? I gave him a drink. I gave Jesus a drink of water. Oh, he liked my water. And we had the best talk I've ever had in my whole life. Well, the disciples were bothered, bothered, bothered. What's he doing? Sitting with the woman, eating with the woman, talking with the woman. Has he lost his mind again? That Jesus is always breaking the rules out of the sides, coloring outside. Oh, every time we get in trouble with Jesus. They said, Jesus, eat something. They didn't want to talk about it, so they did what most people do. Would you like something to eat? Do you need some lunch? Do you need some food? And he said, oh, I have food. bread and Jesus is the drink unless you eat of me you have no life in you Jesus said my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work okay our multitasking gods is going to do something very powerful right now. Our multitasking, omnipotent, omnipresent God knows how to pull upon every heart. And he knows how to feed you. He knows how to give you to drink. So for the hungry, for the thirsty, there's going to be a commissioning time where we're going to worship God until the lights go out in the house. And then we're going to worship God in our cars and in our homes and in the streets and in the alleys and in the towns. Don't say four months more. Don't say four months more. Okay, right now, if you lift up your hands, Holy Spirit's gonna start falling on people. Now, I feel like I wasn't clear enough last night. But I'm gonna be really clear right now, Holy Spirit, wants to commission people to the harvest. He wants to commission people to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. He wants to commission radical lovers who even if they own something on paper, they don't consider it theirs. He wants to commission radical lovers to go to the ends of the earth and across the street. He wants you to see. He wants to open blind eyes. And he wants to break hard hearts. He wants to bring great, 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 great weeping in this place. And he also wants to 
fill some people with incredible joy. And being God, we can engage in worship, be commissioned as ministers and missionaries in all kinds of fields around the world. We can love God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits. We can be set free from any demonic force. There's going to be people being set free during worship. Others are going to be liberated. Others are going to see visions of Somalia, Sudan, Mozambique, Brazil, Ethiopia, Tennessee, New Jersey, Tampa, Pensacola, all kinds of vision. Sarasota, for sure. Meanwhile, eat, Jesus eats, and he says, my food is to do the will of one who sent me. And Brooke, finish his work, no matter what it costs you. Finish his work. No matter what it costs you. Now, here comes the call. Now you gotta you gotta engage with God. Don't if you even start to look at me, I'm gonna run so fast out that door. You start engaging with God right now. When he touches you, you want to give your life totally, completely to worship God. You want to leave your water pots. Holy! You want to leave your water pot because you know, thank you, you know what living water is. You know Ezekiel 47, Revelation 22. You don't need the water. say we have to wait for the harvest you're gonna see the harvest and you're gonna bring it home I believe even all ministers are gonna get touched tonight so if you want to leave your water pot and you want to abandon yourself to God then I want you to run up on this stage and worship God 